This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Axis and Allies, Guadalcanal. Axis and Allies, Guadalcanal was released in 2007 by Avalon Hill, a division of Hasbro. The game was designed by the original creator, Larry Harris Jr., and takes about two hours to play. Now, while this game has Axis and Allies figures, it plays very different than the rest of the games in the Axis and Allies series. Guadalcanal is still essentially a territory control game. However, there's a large focus on the use of supplies and troop deployment. Axis and Allies Guadalcanal is the third in the campaign series of Axis and Allies games. The first game in the series was Axis and Allies D-Day, followed up by Axis and Allies Battle of the Bulge. And the trilogy was concluded with Axis and Allies Guadalcanal. Each of these games focus on a single campaign during World War II. Guadalcanal is one of the first Axis and Allies games to solely focus on the Pacific Theater. While these games are part of an unofficial series, they all play very differently from each other. And in fact, they play radically different than your traditional Axis and Allies game. So let's look at Axis and Allies Guadalcanal and we'll see how different. But first, let's get grounded in this particular area of the Pacific Theater with a historical briefing. The year is 1942. The Japanese Empire has expanded their military force throughout the South Pacific. In January of 1941, Japanese forces overwhelmed Dutch New Guinea and established a major base in the capital of Rabaul. Rabaul allowed the Japanese Empire to expand military operations towards Port Moresby and Australia. The Japanese Empire used their base in Rabaul to expand their influence into the Solomon Islands. In the first major offensive by Allied forces against the Japanese Empire, the United States Marines seized the island of Guadalcanal and a newly created airfield that they renamed Henderson Field. The Allied objective? Prevent Japanese forces from using the Solomon Island chain as air bases to threaten supply routes between the U.S. and Australia. To accomplish this, Allied forces must secure the Solomon Island chain and neutralize the Imperial Japanese military base at Rabaul. The Japanese Empire's goal is to repel Allied naval forces from the Solomon Islands and create air bases along the island chain to block Allied supply routes. How history plays out is up to you when you play Axis and Allies Guadalcanal. So let's take a look at Axis and Allies Guadalcanal and we'll see how the game works. This is the Axis and Allies Guadalcanal game board. This map represents the Solomon Islands in late 1942. Now, let's break down the map to understand the game mechanics. The map is divided into 11 C zones, lettered A through K. Amidst these C zones are six island zones. When the game begins, the American forces have a foothold in the Solomon Islands and have taken Guadalcanal. The Japanese Empire has control of the remaining islands. With the majority of Japanese forces concentrated on the island of Bougainville. Therefore, the Japanese player sits on the northern side of the board. The American player sits on the southern side of the board. To win the game, a player must earn 15 victory points. Victory points are monitored by tracks on each side of the board. Victory points are earned in two ways. 
The first is by eliminating capital ships in sea zones. Capital ships are considered aircraft carriers and battleships. The second is by controlling airfields on the islands. There are nine airfields on the island zones. The Japanese player begins with one completed airfield on the island of Bougainville. Likewise, the American player has one completed airfield on Guadalcanal. The rest of the airfields must be built. To build these airfields, you will need supplies. And those supplies must be shipped in from each nation's base card. Each side has a base card that they use to deploy forces to the Solomon Islands. The American base card is New Caledonia. The Japanese base card is Rabal. There are two ways to transport supplies and reinforcements from the base card to the main board. Air and naval units can move from the main board to the base card and back again. Base cards are located one sea zone away from each side's main island. For example, to reach Rabal, the Japanese base card, units can move off the board edge from sea zone A or B. To reach New Caledonia, the allied base card, units can move off the board edge from sea zone J or K. The second way, in the final phase of each turn, you can spend supply tokens to move units directly to the main board. To deploy units to sea zones near your base card only costs one supply token. However, the farther out along your side of the board you want to deploy units will cost you more supply tokens. The farthest range up to three supply tokens. This will allow you to deploy troops and supplies more quickly to distant islands. Otherwise, you need to ship them in at one sea zone per turn. All conflicts, whether they be in sea zones or island zones, will be resolved with dice rolls in the battle box. Hopefully that gives you a very basic idea of how Axis and Allies Guadalcanal works. So, if you like what you see, stick around. We're going to go through the rules in much greater detail to learn how to play the game. Let's begin by formally setting up Axis and Allies Guadalcanal. So, you know what this means. Get your bits together, people. It's time to set up the game. First, you're going to place the game board. Now, our version of the game board here is slightly different than what you would get in the box, mainly because I've highlighted various aspects of it to make it easier to learn how to play the game. Place the Japanese victory point marker on the Japanese side of the board on space 1. Do the same with the American victory point marker on the American side of the board. And you're going to place the first player marker on the Japanese side of the board. Now we're going to pull back to see what to place around the game board. Place the 12 dice inside the battle box and place it in the play area. Now, on the Japanese side of the board, we're going to place the Rabal base card and the Japanese reference chart. On the American side, we're going to do the same thing with the New Caledonia base card and the American reference chart. Now, all the major game components are out in the play area. Let's focus in and place some of the units. On the left side of the board, we have the Japanese Empire's forces. On the right side is the United States forces. The necessary units to place on the main board are printed on the board itself. However, since we have a bird's eye view of the board, and there are a lot of ship pieces in this game that are hard to identify from far away, 
I've created these custom markers to help us quickly identify the various unit types. You can see that the main board is separated into 11 C zones, labeled A through K. In C zone order, from A to K, we're going to place the Japanese Navy. First, in C zone A, we're going to place one transport. Next is C zone B, and we're going to place one cruiser, two destroyers, and two transports. In C zone C, we're going to place one destroyer and one submarine. There are no naval units in C zone D. In C zone E, we're going to place a cruiser. In C zone F, we're going to place a transport. In C zone G, we're going to place a cruiser and a transport. And that completes the Japanese Navy setup for the main board. Now, C zones H and I do not contain any naval units from either side, but C zones J and K have American vessels. So next, let's place the American vessels in C zone J. First, we're going to place a battleship, then two destroyers, a submarine, and two transports. And finally, in C zone K. We're going to place an aircraft carrier. On that aircraft carrier are two fighters. Next, we're going to place a cruiser, a destroyer, and two transports. And with that, the C zone areas of the board are set up. Now it's time to focus our attention on the island zones. Now, because the island zones can get cramped, you can use chips to save space. A figure always denotes one unit. Add a gray chip beneath the figure to denote one additional unit, and a red chip to denote five additional units. For our play example, I'll use lines beneath the units to denote the additional units. We're going to start in the upper left-hand corner of the board with the island zone of Bougainville. Bougainville is under the control of the Japanese and has one airstrip. The airstrip has one fighter on it. The island also has two supply tokens. Stationed on the island are three Japanese infantry. a howitzer, and an anti-aircraft gun emplacement. Working our way down the Solomon Island chain, our next stop is the island of Choisel. Stationed on Choisel is one Japanese infantry and one howitzer. The next island is Santa Isabel. Stationed on Santa Isabel is one Japanese infantry. Now it's on to Malaita. Stationed on Malaita is one Japanese infantry. In the second row of islands, we're going to start with New Georgia. Stationed on New Georgia is two Japanese infantry a supply token, and a howitzer. And finally, but not least, is the island of Guadalcanal. At the beginning of the game, Guadalcanal is under the control of the Americans. 
The Americans have one airstrip on Guadalcanal. Stationed on Guadalcanal are five U.S. infantry, three supply tokens, three howitzers, and anti-aircraft battery. And with that, we've set up the island zones on the board. And the main board is now fully set up. Next, we're going to populate the units on each side's base card. The Japanese base card is the island of Rabal. In Rabal's harbor are two aircraft carriers. On each of those aircraft carriers are two fighters, a cruiser, a battleship, a destroyer, and two transports. On the island itself, are four infantry, two fighters, two bombers, a howitzer, an anti-aircraft gun, and a supply token. The American base is on the island of New Caledonia. In New Caledonia's harbor is an aircraft carrier. On that aircraft carrier are two fighters. There's a cruiser, two destroyers, a submarine, and two transports. Stationed on New Caledonia Island are three infantry, three howitzers, an anti-aircraft gun, five fighters, and five bombers. And now the base cards for both sides are set up. Now that we have the game set up, we're going to work through a gameplay example of the various game phases, starting with Phase 1, Movement. In the Movement phase, each player takes turn moving specific unit types. On the left and right side of the screen, I've made a list of each of the movement types that we must conduct to complete the Movement phase. The number inside the arrowhead specifies the number of spaces that unit can move. Some units can also take special actions during the movement phase. I've created special icons to denote which of those units get special actions. The Japanese player has the first player token and gets to go first. The first unit to move are transports. I've highlighted all the Japanese transports on the board to make them easier to spot. Transports, like many seagoing vessels, can move one sea zone per turn. However, you'll notice that transports have a special icon that allows them to load units. Let's pause for a moment and learn about transporting other units before we make our moves. Transports and destroyers are the only seagoing vessels that can transport land units. Transports have a capacity of carrying two land units. Destroyers can only carry one land unit. Land units include supply tokens, infantry, anti-aircraft guns, and howitzers. In Phase 1, these ships will load cargo. Then also in Phase 1, the ship will move one sea zone. Then in Phase 2, ships will unload their cargo to participate in the combat phase. In Axis and Allies Guadalcanal, it's important to understand how sea zones and island zones interact with each other. Land units on island zones can access any of the surrounding sea zones. From the island of Bougainville, Troops and supplies can be loaded and unloaded from the following sea zones. Sea zone A, sea zone B, sea zone F, and sea zone E. Land units are critical to taking control of islands and airfields. The only way land units can cross over to different islands is by boarding transports or destroyers. 
Although naval units can only move one sea zone per turn, with clever planning you can initiate one turn island hops. For example, let's say we're going to load a transport in C zone F with two infantry units from the island zone of Bougainville. Without even moving from C zone F, we can offload those troops into two different island zones. In the next phase of the turn, we can offload our infantry onto the island zone of Choisel or the island zone of New Georgia. If your transport is in C zone E, then you can reach the same destination with one movement point. Or, if you have a transport in C Zone B, then you can move those troops with one movement point to Santa Isabel. So, as you can see, with strategic placement of your transports and destroyers, you can reach three of the five other islands on the board from Bougainville. Now, you might have noticed an area on the board in C zones G and H called the slot. Transports and destroyers located in C zones in the slot can reach up to four islands in one turn. For example, let's say we load troops in Guadalcanal. From Guadalcanal, we can reach Santa Isabel without using a movement point. By using our one movement point, we can reach the following islands. Malaita by going from C zone H to C zone D. Choisel by traveling from C zone H to C zone G. Or New Georgia by moving from C zone H to either C zone G or C zone I. You can also reach four islands from C zone G in the slot as well. Hopefully these examples will give you an idea of all the different strategies you can employ in this game to island hop. And now back to our game. Okay, the Japanese transports are highlighted and first we need to decide which ones we're going to load with cargo. In C Zone B, we're going to load two infantry onto one transport and an infantry unit and a howitzer on the second transport. So we take our figures off Bougainville Island and put them in the little pile by our transports. Now that I've loaded my transports, I can move them. I'm going to move my transports from C Zone B to C Zone C. Okay, that's the only loading I'm going to do. The rest of the transports on this board I'm just going to move back towards my supply base. I'm going to move my transport in C Zone G to C Zone F. And my transport in C Zone F to C Zone E. Finally, I'm going to move my transport in C Zone A off the board to my base card. And here comes my transport onto the base at Rabal. Now you'll also see in Rabal I have two transports here that need to be dealt with. So on one transport I'm going to load two infantry units. On the second transport I'm going to load an infantry unit and a supply token. And then I'm going to move those two transports off the base card and back to the main board on C Zone A. We'll shift our view back to the main board and see the transports arriving in C Zone A. Now that the Japanese players finished loading and moving their transports, it's the United States turn to do the same. The American player is going to load four infantry onto his two transports in C Zone K. Those transports are then going to move to C Zone D. 
The two transports in C Zone J are going to move off the board to the base card at New Caledonia. So we switch our view to the New Caledonia base card and see our two transports arrive. New Caledonia also has two transports that we need to load and move. On the first transport, we're going to load two infantry units. On the second transport, we're going to load an infantry unit and a howitzer. Then we're going to move both transports off the base card and onto the main board. We switch back to the main board and we see our transports arrive in C Zone K. This completes the United States player's turn with transports. The turn then moves back to the Japanese player who will move his battleships. Except that he doesn't have any battleships at the beginning of the game, so then the turn moves to the American player and he will move his battleships. The American player moves his battleship from C Zone J to C Zone H. And that completes the United States player's turn with battleships. Now we switch back to the Japanese player who will conduct his moves with aircraft carriers. There is a Japanese battleship on the base card at Rabaul. The Japanese player is going to move that battleship to the main board. The Japanese battleship arrives in C Zone B. With that movement complete, the turn switches to the Allied player. The American player moves his battleship from C Zone J to C Zone H. And that completes the United States player's turn with battleships. Now we switch back to the Japanese player who will conduct his moves with aircraft carriers. On the Japanese base card of Rabaul, we have two aircraft carriers fully loaded with fighter planes. Since both aircraft carriers are fully loaded with fighter planes, we're going to move them down to the main board. On the return route to the main board, we're going to bring them into C Zone B. Remember, on the Japanese side, C Zones A and B are linked to the base card. C Zones J and K are linked to New Caledonia on the American side. Now that the Japanese aircraft carrier turn is over, we switch over to the American side. On the main board, the American player has one aircraft carrier loaded with two fighters. The American player is going to move this aircraft carrier from C Zone K to C Zone H. The American player has another aircraft carrier loaded with two fighters on his base card. He is going to move these to the main board. We switch back to the main board and watch our aircraft carrier sail in to C Zone K. The Allied aircraft carrier turn is over and we switch to the Japanese player to conduct the cruiser moves. There are three Japanese cruisers on the main board. The cruiser in C Zone B and the cruiser in C Zone E will move to C Zone F. The cruiser in C Zone G is going to hold position. On the Japanese base card in Rabaul, there's one cruiser. We're going to move that cruiser to the main board. Back on the main board, our cruiser pulls in to C Zone A. We then switch to the American side who will move their cruisers. On the main board, the only cruiser the Americans have is in C Zone K. The American player is going to move that cruiser from C Zone K to C Zone D. There is one cruiser on the base card in New Caledonia. We're going to move that cruiser to the main board. Our cruiser sails into C Zone K 
and we've completed the cruiser turn for the United States. Next we flip to the Japanese side and we're going to load and move destroyers. The destroyers in C Zone B are going to move to the base card. The destroyer in C Zone C is going to hold position. Our destroyers arrive in Rabal and we still have one destroyer left to load and move. First our destroyer is going to load an anti-aircraft gun and then move to the main board. Our destroyer makes it to the main board and moves to C Zone B. Then it's the United States turn to load and move their destroyers. The United States has destroyers in C Zone J and C Zone K. We're going to move all three of those destroyers to the base card in New Caledonia. The three American destroyers arrive at the base in New Caledonia. There are two more destroyers on the base card that we can load and move. The Allied player is going to load those destroyers with two howitzers. And then send them to the main board. Our two destroyers with howitzers arrive in C Zone J. This ends the destroyer section of the movement phase and we move to submarines on the Japanese side. Submarines have the ability to move and attack in the movement phase. So let's pause for a moment and learn more about that. Submarine attacks can be conducted in two ways. The first way is to remain in the current sea zone and attack a target there. For example, this Japanese submarine in Sea Zone F can choose any naval target within the same sea zone by declaring, I will take no movement and attack. You must always declare your movement decision before you attack the target. So you cannot attack a target and then flee to another sea zone. The second way is to move to an adjacent sea zone and attack a target there. Now that we've learned how to conduct attacks, let's learn about the targets themselves. In Axis and Allies Guadalcanal, there are three different ship strengths. Normal strength ships, like submarines and transports, can be destroyed on a roll of one or two. Aircraft carriers, cruisers, and destroyers have resilience. Ships with resilience can only be destroyed on a roll of one. On a roll of two, the ship is damaged and immediately moved to the base card's damage section. The strongest class are battleships. Battleships have resilience with heavy armor. When rolling against a battleship, the first hit is always absorbed by the heavy armor. Subsequent hits will follow resilience rules. A roll of 1 destroys the battleship, and a roll of 2 damages the battleship and forces it back to the base card. When choosing a target for a submarine attack, be aware of the ship's resilience and its strategic value. Battleships and aircraft carriers are capital ships and can earn you one victory point. Aircraft carriers, destroyers, and transports carry other units. Eliminating a destroyer or a transport will destroy the cargo as well. Sinking an aircraft carrier will force its fighters to find a nearby friendly airfield. If no nearby friendly airfields exist, then the fighters are destroyed. Attack ships like battleships, cruisers, and destroyers can blockade shipping routes. Since transporting supply tokens to build air bases is critical to winning the game, eliminating these shipping threats is also a viable strategy. As always, the ultimate decision is up to you. Now let's return to our game and we'll play out the submarine moves. The Japanese player has one submarine in C Zone C. 
The Japanese player announces that he's going to move the submarine from Sea Zone C to Sea Zone D and conduct an attack on the American cruiser. Now, let's look at this attack more closely. Since this is a single dice roll, we're going to save the battle box explanation for a little later and just focus on the mechanics of the submarine attack itself. In this example, we have our Japanese submarine, that's the attacker, and the American cruiser, which is the target. This is a one dice roll chance to see if we can hit the cruiser. If we roll a 1, the cruiser is destroyed. If we roll a 2, the cruiser is damaged and forced back to its base card. A roll of 3 through 6 is a miss and the attack is over. So let's roll the dice and see what our result is. And we rolled a 2, so the cruiser is damaged. Whenever a ship is damaged, it immediately moves back to the home base card and is placed in the damaged section. So we move the cruiser off the main board. The damaged cruiser is moved to the New Caledonia base card and placed in the damaged square. Now we move to the allied player to take their submarine turn. The American submarine in C-Zone J is going to move to C-Zone I. There are no enemy units in range of this submarine to attack, so there will be no attacks for this unit this turn. The American player also has a submarine on his base card. He is going to move his submarine onto the main board. The second American submarine arrives on the main board in C-Zone J. Now we switch over to the Japanese side to conduct the bomber movement. Now let's pause and talk about air units. Plane movement is divided in half. The first half of plane movement takes place during the movement phase. In Phase 3, the second half takes place where the plane returns and lands. Bombers have a total movement of 6, 3 out in the movement phase and 3 back in the regroup phase. Fighters have a total of 4 movement, 2 out during the movement phase and 2 back during the regroup phase. This early in the game, the Japanese player only has one airstrip in Bougainville. There is already a fighter located on that airstrip. Since we have only one available slot open on that airstrip, we need to decide what we're going to bring from our island base in Rabal. Switching to our base card in Rabal, you can see that we have two bombers. There are also two fighters, one of which I could move up to the main board instead of a bomber. The Japanese player decides there's already enough fighters on the main board and he's going to move one bomber. So the bomber flies into C-Zone A and is in the air waiting to land. Gameplay then moves to the allied player. United States has an airfield on Guadalcanal, which I'm assuming is Henderson Field. Anyway, there are two slots on that airfield to land planes. There are no bombers on the main board, so let's go to New Caledonia and check there. The American player has five bombers on New Caledonia. The American player is going to fly two of those bombers out to the airfield on Guadalcanal. So the two American bombers fly into C-Zone J and wait above the airfield to land in a later phase. Now it's the Japanese player's turn to move his fighters. So for this turn, the Japanese player is going to launch all four fighters from his two aircraft carriers and proceed from C-Zone B to C-Zone D. The two fully loaded transports seem the likely targets here. And with that, the Japanese player ends his movement turn. Now we switch to the American player and he will move his fighters. 
The American player is going to launch his fighters to try to protect his transports in C Zone D. And with that, the American player ends his fighter turn and the movement phase is complete. And that completes the first half of Axis and Allies Guadalcanal. We'll return next week with the second episode that will cover the last two phases of gameplay, as well as some optional rules. As always, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.